Hello, Sourdough Mamas. Thank you so much for joining me again here on the Sourdough Mamas podcast. I'm excited for today's episode because I know it's a topic that touches really close to a lot of our hearts. Um, We're going to be talking about sourdough starter today. This is sourdough starter challenges number two, and this is a series of um, episodes all about sourdough starter challenges, Um, just because there are so many to talk about. The first one is episode two. So you can either go to levenly.com slash episode dash two or levenly.com slash podcast, and you can find it there. And in that one, um, we talked about a few other sourdough starter issues, basically like, what is it? How do you make one? And what can go wrong? I think is basically what we covered in that first one. Today, we're going to cover what, when, and how to feed. Um, That is probably the most common question I get. Uh, Leaven versus starter, we're also going to talk about. Um, Liquid on the top of your starter, what is it? Why is it there? What do you do with it? We're going to also discuss that. And finally, how do we keep our sourdough starter warm? Uh, We are getting into the spring months, if you're listening with me as these are released. So environments are getting warmer, so it's a little less of a concern, but it still is quite chilly in a lot of places. Still wanted to touch on it because I still think it's important to understand. So with all that said and done, uh, I think you know, I mean, if you're listening to the Sourdough Mamas podcast, you are a sourdough baker or you're interested in sourdough baking. Um, Before we get started, I want to tell you about courses.levenly.com where you can head on over. There are paid courses, there are free courses. And I also have, this is a little secret knowledge for Sourdough Mamas podcast listeners but I have a new workshop in the works uh, behind the scenes. So just be aware of that, that that is coming eventually. I do have a super busy <laughs> life. Um, I, I hear from you guys all the time saying, I don't know how she does it all. I don't really know how I do it all either. Um, I do have a house cleaner that comes every two weeks. So that's probably how I do it all. Otherwise this place would be falling apart. Uh, but it is busy. So we do have a workshop in the works right now. Um, so stay tuned for that. That's super exciting. So yeah, courses at levenly.com. You can find a ton of stuff over there, even the sour to starter discard challenge, which is really fun. If you haven't made any discard recipes yet, or if you're looking to challenge yourself with new recipes, head on over there, sign up for the challenge and just start baking. It's super fun. I guarantee you're going to love it. And that is completely free. So go check that out. So Let's go ahead and get started talking about the sourdough starter challenges because as bakers, as sourdough lovers, we love our starters, right? It's one of those, if you know, you know, situations. Um, We pour our heart and soul into these starters and um, anyone that doesn't bake sourdough just simply, I don't think understands. So that's why we're talking about it in depth so much today. So the first thing I'm going to discuss is what, when, and how to feed. I think this is an important concept because there's some misinformation out there. And also, I think a lot of times new bakers, new sourdough starter owners can kind of get in the weeds on some of this stuff. And really, truly, it can be very simple. So let's go ahead and get started. So what do you feed your starter? Um, There isn't just one type of starter. Okay, let's kind of get that clear right now. There are so many different kinds. There are rye starters, there are wheat starters, there are white flour starters, there are einkorn starters, there are liquid starters, there are stiff starters. So there's all kinds. So basically you just kind of need to pick what is going to work best for you. Um, Basically, if you are going to be making just general sourdough, I would recommend a mix, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but a mix of flours. Making a starter from scratch using a mix of flours also is going to get you the most success um, because I think it's, it helps to introduce the most beneficial yeasts and bacteria to your starter. So something like a white and rye mix or a white and whole wheat mix, something like that. Um, And once it's established, you can make it an entirely wheat starter, an entirely white starter, et cetera, kind of up to you. How you wanna maintain it, like I said, it depends on what you want to be making, what your baking goals are. So do you usually make white sourdough bread? Do you usually make white sourdough rolls? You're probably gonna want just a basic white sourdough starter. 
Um, and that said, you can have wheat in that as well. The wheat flour is going to help nourish your starter and give it a lot more nutrition than just the white starter. Uh, sorry, the white flour in your starter. So even if you're doing all white uh, loaves and everything, I still recommend doing a white wheat mix in your sourdough starter. And that's why just wheat flour is a lot less processed and there's a lot more wild yeasts on that flour that's gonna help nourish your starter. Also how you maintain your starter is entirely dependent on the price of the flour. So rye flour typically is more expensive than just a general all purpose flour. Um, it's going to depend on the accessibility of the flour. So if you live in kind of a rural area where you can easily get, you know, whole wheat flour or all purpose flour, but things like einkorn and rye flour are just really hard to come by, then obviously that's going to play into your decision. So it all it entirely depends on what you want to do with your starter. It doesn't really matter what other people are doing. Um, this is your starter. It's your pet. It's your love. And so you do it however you want to do it. Also, I think we've touched on this before. I definitely mentioned it in the sourdough starter challenges um, episode one, which is actually episode two of the podcast. That's a little confusing. I should think about renaming these. <laughs> Um, I mentioned that if you give a little sprinkle of rye flour to any kind of starter, it's going to give it a boost of activity. And that's because rye flour has the most nutrition, the most substance for your, your starter to eat. And just so by and large, a rye starter is the most active one you can make. Um, but again, it entirely depends on your baking goals, on the price of the flour, on the accessibility of the flour. So just I'll keep that all in mind. Um, a good all purpose starter is the one that I recommend making. Okay, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but a mix of white and wheat flours is my favorite thing to recommend. Multi purpose, all good for everything from rolls to breads to hamburger buns to pancakes to sandwich bread, you know, you can use it for everything. So that's what I use. My Goldie starter um, is a one to two to two feed of 50% white flour, and I typically use all purpose flour mostly because it's easier to get <laughs> than bread flour. And I like easy and I like convenient and it's 50% whole wheat flour. And I use the King Arthur whole wheat flour or the white wheat flour. I can get those at Target, which is half a mile away from me. So that, that's really easy, really convenient. I actually don't have any rye flour right now. Um, I was going to experiment with doing a rye loaf and I went digging around and I actually don't have any rye flour. So I need to put that on my list because I want to play around with that a little bit. After um, talking with Hendrik in my last, one of the last episodes, uh, he talks about making an entirely rye sourdough and how easy it is. And don't be, over, don't be overwhelmed by it and don't be intimidated by it. And I've heard a couple sourdough mamas on the group actually made it after listening to that episode. So that's really encouraging. And I really want to try it, but I just, I don't have any flour. So I have to go buy some. So that is basic, basically the what part of what to feed. Um, I hope that that was helpful because I think, again, we can kind of get in the weeds on this and a lot of people have opinions, but I truly think the easiest and also most beneficial to your starter is the white and wheat mix. So when do we feed our starters? Um, once a day is ideal. And that's like in a perfect world when everything goes right, which it seldom happens. And I'm going to have a perfectly brutally honest minute with you here. I feed my starter once a day, probably 15% of the time. <laughs> I have an 18 month old, a three and a half year old and an almost five year old. I have a dog. I have a husband. I have a busy life. And uh, as Bailey on Sourdough Mama said, I have a lot of things to take care of and to keep alive, including I counted them all the other day. I have about 28 house plants too. So um, there's a lot going on here in this house. It's, it's just crazy. So I feed my sourdough starter every day, only sometimes. Um, and that's just the truth of it. And honestly, it does fine. It is a very hardy starter. It's been through a lot with me because I tend to neglect it. So I want you to know that. So aim to feed it once a day. And I do, I truly aim to feed my starter once a day, um, but I don't always do that and that's okay. I more typically probably like 75% of the time, maybe even less than that, I do every two days. And if that's what you do, that's totally great, it's fine. 
Uh, if you are noticing a lot of water on the top, we're actually going to get to that in a second, but if you're noticing liquid on the top, that's a sign that it's hungry. Um, so we are going to talk about that in just a second. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit there, but um, just know, okay, so perfect world, feed every day. Um, in, a, in the real world situation, every day to every two days is, is totally fine. Or if you are trying to really boost your starter, if you feel like it's sluggish, if you're planning on baking in the next day or two, try feeding it every 12 hours. Uh, that will give it just this huge hit of nutrition and it'll make it super, super active and strong. Um, when I pull mine out of the fridge, when I do store it in the fridge, I feed it every 12 hours, three times in a row before making my 11. So that's just my little trick. I just like to make sure it's nice and strong, nice and active before I expect it to leaven my bread in the oven. So that is basically when to feed your starter. Uh, you can also store it in the refrigerator. I just mentioned that sometimes I do that. So if you're not planning on baking um, on a whim or randomly, if you're thinking, no, I'm not gonna bake for at least a week, go ahead and throw your starter in the fridge. So this begs the question, do I feed the starter and then put it in the fridge? Do I feed the starter and then let it peak and then put it in the fridge? Or do I put it in the fridge as it is? So this again, varies from person to person. There's probably a really good scientific explanation for whatever the correct answer is. But in my opinion, I don't think there is a correct answer. I think you can kind of do anything. So again, perfect world situation. You feed your starter, you let it peak, then you put it in the fridge. Uh, that just lets it get the most activity and lets it get nice and strong before you do put it under refrigeration. But if you don't have time or if life doesn't allow for that, and it's been a little while since you fed it, feed it again and then put it in the fridge. That's fine too. Um, or if it's been two days and you're running around like a chicken with its head cut off, like I do a lot of the time, and you look at it and you say, holy crap, I don't even have time to feed the starter. Put it in the fridge. Don't even feed it. Just put it in the fridge. Um, it's safe in there. Try to keep it toward the front so you can see it as a reminder, like maybe tonight when you get home, you could feed it, uh, something like that. But your fridge is kind of your safe spot for your starter. As long as it's in the fridge, pretty much nothing can happen to it. Um, so that is my advice on when to feed your starter. So now let's talk about how much. So with how much, I think it's important as bakers that we need to switch our thinking from amounts uh, to ratios. So we don't want to be thinking about, do I want to feed my starter 100 grams or a cup? Or instead of that, you want to be thinking about ratios. So a, your ratio basically is the number, the amount of starter to the amount of water to the amount of flour. And it's expressed like, uh, one to one to one. So that's one part starter to one part water to one part flour, or one to two to two, or one to three to three. Or sometimes you'll see something crazy like one to 2.5 to 1.5, like people get all <laughs> crazy with it. Um, I like to keep it simple. As I've said, I think life is too complicated as it is. So let's keep it easy. So you can basically feed your starter whatever ratio that it likes. So here's how you know. If your starter is doubling in less than eight hours, I'd say maybe less than 10 hours, between eight and 10 hours, um, any less than that, even if it's like at four hours, six hours, that's great. It means your starter is super happy, it's healthy, keep feeding it at the ratio that you're feeding it. And if when it comes time to feed, if there's liquid on the top, which again, we're gonna talk about in just a second, um, that means that your starter's hungry. So you're going to want to feed more often or you're gonna to wanna to increase that ratio. So look at the amount of flour and water that you're feeding per the amount of starter and just make adjustments. So this can kind of get some people going. Um, it can seem a little scary, especially talking about it. If you're driving in the car or you're walking the dog and you're listening to this, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But if you actually sit down and write it down, it's not that intimidating. So Here's an example. Um, you can use a one to one to one ratio. Okay. So for example, that would be 60 grams of flour. I'm sorry, start again. 60 grams of starter to 60 grams of water to 60 grams of flour. 60, 60, 60. That's a one to one to one, right? They're all equal. A one to two to two means that your starter amount is something like 30 grams 
whereas, and your water is 60 and your flour is 60. So 30, 60, 60. So that's a one to two to two and et cetera, et cetera. So one to three to three would be 20, 60, 60. So you get what I'm saying? So you can adjust the amount of your starter against the amount of the water in the flour that you're feeding it. And you would do this if you feel like your starter is either too sluggish or way too active. Um, if you're finding that it's all of a sudden, uh, you know, tripling overnight and you only want it to double, you're going to want to adjust your ratio or, you know, there's no such thing as a, as a starter that triples that's bad. You know, I think, I think we always tend to say doubling, but if it triples, that's a sign of a healthy starter too. So that was a little bit of a tangent, but so for example, if you're using 10 grams of flour or you're using hundred grams of flour, it doesn't matter the amount, as long as your ratio is the same. So this is important because a lot of new bakers will read a recipe or they'll get advice from their friend or something that'll say, feed your starter, you know, one cup of wheat flour, one cup of white flour, two cups of water. They have this giant bowl of starter and it's this excessive amount and they have so much discard and so much waste from it. So you don't have to, as long as you keep your ratio the same, you can take that feeding amount down as much as you want. So for example, one more example, and then I'll move on. I feed Goldie on a one to two to two. I feed her 30 grams with her starter, and then I give her 60 grams of flour and 60 grams of water, and that's a one to two to two. And if you wanted to take that from that 150 gram amount to a teeny tiny micro feed, you could literally feed three grams of starter with six grams of water and six grams of flour. And that is still a one to two to two ratio. And that's gonna be a tiny little feed. It's only gonna be 15 grams. It's still gonna work. Uh, it's just a lot less waste. So you can make adjustments based on how much waste you want and how much discard you wanna collect. For example, right now I'm feeding Goldie a lot more than my normal amount because I'm trying to collect a lot for discard because I'm kind of practicing with some recipes I'm making. So just make adjustments with the ratio. Kind of talked about that for a long time. I hope that wasn't really confusing, <laughs> but I just want to hit home that you want to start thinking about the ratio of your starter feeds and not so much the amounts. So uh, one story that was shared on Sourdough Mama's quite a while ago, I think it was over a year ago, um, was from Margie. And she told this really great story about how she ran out of starter. And I'll just read you what she said. She said, I had an oops and I miscalculated a feeding, which made me a little short on fed starter for a recipe. So I scraped out everything I had in the jar for the recipe. And then she said, I figured there has to be thousands of good bacteria clinging to the jar. So I took two or three tablespoons of water, shook it in the jar to wash the bits of starter clinging to the sides. I weighed the water in another jar and added equal amount of flour. And then after it bubbled, I put it in the fridge for a week. Then she said, I fed it last night until, and it bubbled just fine. So she said, if you find yourself short of starter, all you need is what's clinging to the side of your jar to rinse it out and feed it. Um, she did say that she has dried starter in case of emergencies, but that's really interesting. So um, we always think that we need so much starter left over, but literally you can scrape your jar clean and just use those tiny scrapings in the bottom of your jar. And that's all you need to get it going again. Um, obviously that's in dire situations <laughs> like Margie was in. And actually I was in that, that, that situation recently too. I used almost all my starter up and I remembered that post. So I thought at the time I got to share this on the podcast. So other people know that they can do this too, because it worked. It took me two days to get it back to the normal volume. Um, and I honestly didn't do it as scientifically as Margie did. I, I just added a little bit of water. I swirled it around and I did a couple little scoops of <laughs> flour stirred it till it felt like it was good, like a good uh, texture, a good feel, um, a good thickness. And then I just left it and crossed my fingers and it worked just great. Um, so that also works too. Again, with sourdough, we don't need to overcomplicate things, right? Sourdough has been around for thousands and thousands of years. So we don't need to overcomplicate it at all. Okay, moving on to problem number two not really a problem, more of a question I get from people. And it's a very valid question. What is the difference between leaven and starter? So it's a great question. Um, it really depends on your technique. So basically 
the short answer is there is no difference at all. Okay, the um, your leaven is basically a middleman, and it's a middleman between your dough and your starter. So you're going to take some of your starter, you're going to make a leaven in a different jar, and you're going to use that different jar of leaven to put in your dough, and then your starter stays the same over here on the counter, you know, unchanged. But some people just kind of superfeed their starter. Again, going back to the ratios, you can increase the amounts based on your ratios. And then they have enough in their jar to add to their dough. And then they have enough left over to keep the starter. So some people don't make 11, some people do. I think it's really preference. And I think as beginners, it's probably a good idea to make 11. And here's why, and I still make 11. <laughs> Um, I've been baking sourdough for years and years now, and I still make 11 because like I've talked about already, my life is so crazy. It's full of distraction. There's always kids running around. There are just, it's the house is chaos. It's a mess. And it's, uh, things are very distracting. And my attention is being pulled in 10 different directions all the time. So I worry that if I don't make 11, that I'm going to use up all of my starter and not have any left which, you know, going back to Margie's story, I could do that. But again, I might not have enough in that jar to make the amount of dough, the amount of bread that I want to make. So that's why I make 11. I started out as a beginner making 11 and I never changed my technique because I like to find what works for me and I stick to that. And um, if I'm the kind of person that if I change things up, I, I get anxious about it and I get stressed out and I'm really worried that something's going to go horribly wrong. I need to be able to be on autopilot when I do this stuff. So that's why I make 11. Truly, truly, you can, you can do either, whichever works for you. So that's the difference. Um, I guess I'm just a little bit paranoid and kind of superstitious about my 11. I like to make 11 and that's that. <laughs> um, another issue that people run into or a challenge is that sometimes when they go and look at their starter, there's some liquid on top. So I've alluded to this a couple of times already, and this is an important topic. Um, you may have heard of hooch, and hooch is an, like an alcoholic byproduct of yeast fermentation. So there are obviously wild yeasts in your sourdough starter, and we are fermenting. That's why you know we're, we're dealing with fermentation all the time with our dough. So those yeasts and everything are fermenting in there. They're producing alcohol. So you basically have a kind of janky moonshine on the top of your starter. <laughs> if you want to think about it that way, I don't recommend drinking it. Um, but that's what is on the top of your starter. So it might be clear. It might be light gray. It might be dark gray. It might be almost blackish. It might be brown. All colors of hooch are okay. I mean, I'd be really surprised if you saw like yellow. Um, but that said, any kind of hue somewhere around orange or pink is actually really bad. Um, that is a sign of mold and that should be unfortunately thrown away. Um, that's one of the catastrophic events that I always talk about with starters. And that's why you should go right now and pa pause this podcast and go dry some of your sourdough starter to keep for an emergency because these things happen. We don't expect them to happen. Nobody expects to drop their jar on the floor, but it happens and you can't save that. Uh, you know, there's broken shards of glass in your starter. You, you, can't, you can't get it all out. You don't know if there's any in there. So that's gone. Nobody expects mold, uh, but sometimes it happens. So dry your starter. So if you see orange or pink hooch in your starter, uh, if it's like a tinge liquid, or if there's like streaks or dots in it, that's a bad sign and I would throw that away. So, but otherwise, any kind of variation between uh, clear and black or brownish is great. Um, and especially if you put your starter in the fridge and you forget about it for weeks and weeks and months and months, and then you're like, what is this? And you pull it out and there's like an inch of black liquid on the top. <laughs> it looks really freaky, uh, it looks really gross. Nobody wants to see that in the refrigerator, but it's actually fine. So basically what your starter is trying to tell you, if there's any amount of liquid on the top is that it's hungry. It's trying to tell you like, feed me, feed me. I am hungry. So if it's happening, if you're getting liquid on top of your starter in between feeds, then that is a sign that you need to increase your ratio or feed it more often. 
So if I skip a day with Goldie, like I said, sometimes, well, most times, um, I feed her twice a day. I mean, every two days. <laughs> I wish I fed her twice a day. She'd be a lot happier. Um, when I feed her every two days, there's a thin layer of, of hooch on top, very, very tiny amount. And also her bubbles on top are really tiny. They're thin. They're like watery looking flimsy bubbles. They're not the thick, juicy ones that you see in a really, really healthy starter. Those are two signs that your starter's hungry. And so you're, it's basically begging you to feed it. So go ahead and feed it. Play around with increasing the ratio or increasing the amount of times that you feed, uh, maybe twice a day if you can, or just once a day if you're not feeding that often. If you missed a feed, like life happens and three days go by and you're like, oh shoot, and you look and there's liquid on top, it's not a big deal. Don't even worry about it. Look for that orange or pink hue, but it, within three days, it's not gonna happen. Um, and so you can either stir in the hooch and that will give your starter a more sour flavor, or you can pour it off and then just feed as normal. Totally depends on what you're looking for. I think most people recommend pouring it off, but a lot of people do stir it in. So it's, it's totally what you want and what you're looking for. And it's also a fun experiment too. If you're looking to play around with your starter, um, starve it for a little while, stir that hooch in, starve it a little while, stir the hooch in and then make bread and see if you taste any difference. So that's a fun experiment for you to try if you're interested. And again, if you're, start, if you're storing your starter in the fridge and it has hooch on top, that is absolutely totally normal. So like I said, pour it off, stir it in, whatever you wanna do. If you stored your starter in the fridge and it didn't have hooch on top, that would be weird and abnormal. So hooch on top in the fridge is absolutely normal. So that's the story about the liquid on top. Um, speaking of mold, I remember a couple of years ago, I think it was right in the beginning of the pandemic in like the summer of 2020, maybe I thought I killed my starter. Um, I think it had been four days, four or five days that I didn't feed it on the counter and I opened it up and I looked inside and it, it smelled terrible. Like it didn't smell sour. It smelled really Oh gosh, how would I even explain it? Really sharp, um, really acidic, this awful smell that like punched me in the face. I'd never smelled it before. So I actually posted on Sourdough Mamas and I said, uh, everyone, I might've killed my starter. Like here I am, you know, the administrator of this group, the owner of Levenly.com and I might've killed my starter. You know, it happens, <laughs> it happens to all of us. So um, I said, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and feed it tonight and again in the morning and again the next night and just see what happens. And luckily, luckily Goldie came back to life. So she was not dead after all, but I thought I had lost my starter to mold. I was certain. Um, I didn't, I did see some liquid on top, but there wasn't any color to it as far as I can remember. So again, if that happens to you, don't fret, just feed it and it's probably fine. It's really, really, really hard to kill a starter. Really hard, like really, really hard. <laughs> Trust me, if I can make, keep a starter alive, so can you. Um, so the last thing I wanna kind of touch on is keeping your starter warm. So like I said, it's getting into the spring months in a lot of places, or if you're in the other um, hemisphere, I guess it's getting into the fall months, but um, for most of us, it's getting warmer. So it's a little less of a concern, but it is still chilly and we are still getting these cold spurts every once in a while. So it's important to keep your starter warm. You don't have to. Okay, again, I wanna make sure that you kind of get the picture that sourdough is super easy, super easy, super forgiving, super flexible. If you have a cold kitchen, it's fine. Your starter will do just fine. It's just gonna be slower and it's gonna be sluggish and you, you might not have it peaking by the time you expect it to be peaking. So you might not be able to schedule your bread baking around it like you usually do. That's really the only concern with it. So controlling the temperature with your starter just gives you a huge upper hand over scheduling and also feeds. So that's why we would wanna keep it warm. Starter likes a, a temperature of around 75 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which in Celsius is about 24 to 28 degrees. Um, obviously most of us don't have homes that warm. We don't choose to have homes that warm. Sometimes in the summer it happens. If we don't have air conditioning or any kind of cooling in our home, it gets that warm. But I don't think any of us would choose to be that hot, <laughs> but starter likes to be that hot. So 
It's warmer than the average house. And so this is an issue that a lot of people run into so much so that I kept seeing, I think it was last winter, I kept seeing posts about how to keep sourdough starter warm on the Sourdough Mamas Facebook group. So I went and I kind of gathered everybody's suggestions and I made a blog post about it. So if you're dealing with this, head over to levenly.com slash warm starter, and you can see a huge list of ideas. Um, I'm going to read through a couple of them in a minute. But like I said, it's okay to have it in a cooler environment. But the last episode of the Sourdough Mamas podcast, I was talking with Eric from Sour House, and he's the co-creator of Goldie, which is a little confusing, I know, because my starter's name is also Goldie. So he's the co-creator of a of starter warmer. It's uh, basically a little disc that you plug into your kitchen, and there's a nice glass jar that goes on top as a lid, um, and it it warms your starter to that perfect Goldilocks zone of 75 to 82, which is why he called it, they called it Goldie, um, which is really cute. But of course, for me and my listeners, it's kind of confusing. Um, I should just change the name of my starter. Um, so uh, Eric is still, and Jenny, Eric and Jenny over at Sour House, they're still in the kick booster phase of this uh, prototype. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely check it out. It's, I have a prototype in my kitchen and I actually use it all the time. I love it. My starter is always, always in there. So yes, Goldie loves Goldie. So head over to sourhouse.co slash Levenly to find out more about Goldie. You can sign up to be on their email list. If you're, li if you're listening to this um, early enough, you can be a VIP and you'll be notified once it goes live on Kick Booster. And then when it does on that first day, if you sign up for it, you get a huge, 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 huge discount, like big, big, big time discount, probably the cheapest you're ever going to get it. And I'm telling you right now, if you're dealing with a cold kitchen, this is going to change your sourdough game. Um, I don't vouch for products that I don't really like. I like to try a lot of things and I don't, I would never encourage people to try things that I myself didn't have a good experience with. And I'm telling you right now, this Goldie starter warmer is the bee's knees. Okay. <laughs> it's the cat's pajamas. You're going to want to get it. So head over to sourhouse.co slash Levenly, find out more about it, get your name on the email list, even just to get more information about it. And um, yeah, it's going to be really exciting. So that's one way to keep it warm is to just get a Goldie. Uh, that's super easy. You just plug it in and forget about it. You don't have to do a thing. Goldie does everything for you. But if you don't want to get a Goldie, then you can look at this blog post that I made and get some ideas. So let's look through a couple here. So you can get, <laughs> you can get a seed mat, um, which is like uh, something you'd put under seeds when you're germinating inside. So that can help. Um, I like this one. Some bakers use a toddler size fleece hat to keep their sourdough starter warm by wrapping it around the jar. Um, that's pretty cute. And what you would do is use warm water, obviously, and then the hat would keep the heat in the jar. Um, you can use a USB mug warmer. You can wrap your starter jar in your dog's winter coat. That's actually pretty funny. There's a story there from Hugh Jackman, who um, basically, I think he's in a restaurant and he pulls out his sourdough starter that's wrapped up in his dog's winter jacket. <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny. You should go to the blog post and see that. It's pretty cute. Um, you can put it my favorite way to do it is actually this. So you can put it in the microwave. Don't turn the microwave on, obviously, but close the door as much as you can without it pulling shut. So you want to kind of leave the door open a teensy bit so the light stays on, but the door is shut as much as you can. So you get that ambient heat from the light and it's surrounding your, your starter. It kind of makes a little proofing box. And similarly, you could put um, a measuring cup, like the one of the glass Pyrex, of boiling water on one side of your microwave and then the starter on the other. And that would keep it nice and warm and also humid and humidity helps fermentation as well. So that would get it, get it going for you. And finally, a couple more ideas. Somebody puts theirs next to their lava lamp, which is kind of hilarious. If you can imagine that some people wrap it in little Christmas lights, which is pretty cute. And, um, others put it on the counter above the dishwasher, which is running on a high temperature. So those are just a few ideas to keep your starter warm. And again, like we talked about, you don't absolutely need to, it's not gonna die if it's too cold. Obviously you can freeze starter, um, but even then it still doesn't die. It's not gonna die if you freeze it. Um, starter is really hard to kill. 
So those are just some ideas from my blog post. Um, definitely head over, check out Goldie if you can. Uh, just even head to that website and get your name on the list. You will not be disappointed. Believe me, it's amazing. So that is pretty much it for this episode of the Sourdough Mamas podcast. Thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. I hope this was helpful with the sourdough starter challenges you're facing. If you're dealing with any others, shoot me an email and maybe title it something like podcast episode idea or starter challenge or something like that. And I would love your ideas for new challenges that you are facing in the real world with your starter, because this is going to be an ongoing series, as I mentioned. And so I want to hear from you about the issues that you're facing. So shoot those over to heather at levenly.com. Let me know. And also don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for tuning in and happy baking.